This week on the show. Going wild in Chile. We've actually found a Waymo deer. Can you see him in the distance? Treasure hunting in Lebanon. And on board a leaky boat in crocodile infested waters. I have uh, lots of water in my boat. I don't know exactly why yet, but uh, here it is. Chilean Patagonia, a place where tradition is meeting progression. A wild, majestic spectacle where one of the world's longest countries has benefited from the largest land donation in history to create a conservation project on a vast scale. Among the plans in place is an initiative hoping to bring more visitors to the area called the Route of Parks, joining 17 old and new national parks together to create a huge network of wild areas to explore, more than 1,700 miles. My journey to its heart takes me six hours in a 4x4 along rough terrain. So we've blown a tire and as you can see behind me, the road is pretty rough. We've hit one of these huge potholes and I guess that's part of the story of tourism here. The infrastructure is still a work in progress for the government, but for two philanthropists, Doug and Chris Tompkins, the route of parks was just the latest part in a decades long project in both Chile and Argentinian Patagonia. Doug had spent time in Patagonia before creating the clothing brand North Face, and Chris had been CEO of the brand Patagonia. When he decided to get out of business and do something different with his life, to dedicate his life to conservation and those things that he loved, these two countries came back into the front of his mind. In 1991, Doug bought a coastal farm in southern Chile, and over 30 years, along with Chris and the Tompkins Conservation Organization, they bought two million acres across Chile and Argentina. Rewilding came high on their agenda, repopulating the diverse range of species that had become critically imbalanced. The numbers of Nyandu birds in Chile have dropped significantly. In this valley, rewilding has raised numbers from a dozen to around 70 so far. So how does the Nyandu fit into the, the ecosystem here? Entonces cumple un rol super interesante en la medida en que él se va moviendo, va dispersando semillas. Además que dentro de, de la cadena trófica o de la red trófica que hay acá, es parte también, es alimento. Eh, el puma, que es el depredador tope, eh, también caza choy, que no solamente buena cosa, también caza choy. Entonces cumple un rol super importante desde el punto de vista como un herbívoro y como una presa dentro del territorio. Es un trabajo solitario, efectivamente. Eh, sin embargo, es reconfortante. The changes here have brought new opportunities for locals through tourism and a range of work, including for that traditional Chilean cultural icon, the gaucho. Don Daniel now helps monitor the native waymill deer. Bueno, a mí me me gusta más trabajar con waymills porque 
me ha cambiado la vida de cierta forma. Eh, si yo hubiese tra estado trabajando con ganado o ya sea con vaca o oveja, hubiera sido distinta mi forma de ver el parque o, o de ver los gomules quizás también. Traditionally, Gaucho is a horseman, skilled at protecting cattle and sometimes hunting predators. But now, Don Daniel has a wider view of the predators as an important part of the animal network. Today, Don Daniel uses modern techniques to track the tag waymule deers nearby. So the signal's quite strong when we point the antenna that way. It's like one of those TV antennas from the 70s or 80s that you had on your roof. But it seems to be doing a, the job. Oh, yep, I can hear it. Ninety-nine percent of the original Waymuir population are thought to have been lost, leaving them endangered. But with Don Daniel's help, we soon spot something in the distance. Gosh, look at Don Daniel go! So. We've actually found a Waymore deer. Can you see him in the distance? He's just sitting there in the grass and he's quite well camouflaged. We move for a closer look and quickly see that there are in fact three Waymore together. So we're approaching the deer from a lower ground angle so we don't scare them. Esta familia es por lo general es super tranquila. La la toñita es más curiosa que la lenga, pero la lenga igual se acerca mucho a uno. Pero bueno, las conozco desde que nacieron, de cuando tenían días. unbelievable that now the numbers have grown and we've been able to track them within the space of a quarter of an hour and here we are and we're able to get this close to them. In 2017 Tompkins Conservation donated the last of the parks to the Chilean state under the condition that they are protected as national parks. The Chilean government also added to existing national park land to create the Route of Parks, an area the size of Switzerland. The Tompkins donation was said to be the biggest private land donation to a country in world history, but it was not without controversy. I think that colonization of territory in human history is absolutely discussed as it should be. There's no question about that. I don't think we can roll back the clock and hope that slavery didn't happen and that, that almost the entire globe was conquered by four or five imperialist countries. There's no question about that. I am very proud of what we do because every hectare we have ever purchased goes right back to the people of the country. Tragically, Doug never saw the completion of the donation, passing away in 2015. A good friend of mine from New York City wrote to me just a few days after he died, and she said, look, you have a choice here. You can be the long-suffering widow, or you can get out of bed and go do these things. And she was right. I had, that was a conscious decision I was going to have to make. And so I just thought, okay, let's go for it. And that's when I started trying to tie up everything. And within two years, we had them all donated. Wow. 
and that was a lot of work. And I think it saved my life, needing to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And what would Doug have said? Sitting here now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he would have said, good job, bird. <laughs> I imagine he's pretty happy. Yeah. Great. I'm happy. Yeah. I mean, we're not we're not done yet, mm -hmm. but I hope we're never done. Well, stay with us because still to come on the travel show. The neglected treasures of Tripoli. We're with the man who's made it his mission to document these Lebanese artifacts before they disappear forever. And we catch up with Carolus as he attempts to make it up Sri Lanka's historic Hamilton Canal by paddle. And this time, he's in it up to his neck. So don't go away. Welcome back to Patagonia here in the foot of Chile. And just over there, you can see the border with Argentina. And I can tell you, it gets pretty chilly down here. But let's head now to a totally different climate and a different part of the world. We're crossing to Lebanon next and to its second city, Tripoli. It's not quite as well known as its big brother Beirut to the south, but what it lacks in fame, it makes up for in public art and architecture. After hundreds of years out in the elements, its many artifacts are beginning to show signs of wear and neglect. But one man has made it his mission to record these Islamic treasures for posterity. The priority today of the people is not art, it's about finding medicine or finding food to sustain their daily life. Despite this, art is still valuable and important. Now it's more important than ever because we have a huge risk of losing them. My name is Basim Zaudeh. I was born in Tripoli. I was raised in Tripoli. My family is also from Tripoli. Tripoli is everything to me. What I really like in this city, it's like in its really authentic city, yet but it's still working since its establishment. So it never stopped. And the people here, they are, they are fighters and survivors. I started really exploring the city. I just saw how rich the city is, like in art and architecture and culture and traditions. After this alleyway, we would go right, then we would go left. Then you would see just the door of an old facade of a school. And then if you look just left, you would see a beautiful pattern, just in the middle of a stairway going up. Can you imagine how much work this will take? Someone will design it and then someone will try to sculpt it and to carve it into stone and someone to come and place it here to decorate this facade and then we just forget about it easily. Look at this example, by the way. You would see 700 year old patterns just covered with graffiti. They could have done it on a lot of other places. Why just here on top of them? And look at these two beautiful schools, al Khatuni and the Sukrukiya. You can see the history of the city literally fading away. The purpose of this project is to document and digitalize the Islamic art that we have in the city to preserve them for the future generations. One, two, three. After taking three photos from three angles, I would be importing them to this program so I can take the mutual points and then create an orthogonal photo so I'd have a 
a very sharp 2D version of the, of the pattern itself. God forbid if anything occurs in the city, it would be a catastrophe because we would be losing the original artwork. But since we, we documented these artworks, we were able to create the exact professional version with the exact lines that the artist used 700 years ago. A lot of my work now reflects the history of the art of the city. And working with these old materials and artistic designs, I felt like I was part of history now. Like there's something of me attached to these stone pieces. I wish I could be positive, hoping good things for the future of Lebanon and Tripoli, but the problem is that we are losing a lot of good minds traveling and immigrating everywhere in, in the world. But I hope one day, Tripoli would regain its power and its glory, and that the people would have more time and more energy to respect art and to love the city, and maybe to see it the way I see it. Explorer Carolus Miliaskis is on his latest challenge, paddling 50 kilometers down Sri Lanka's canal network to the capital, Colombo. After meeting the people leading efforts to clean the waterways, we join him in Nogombo for the next stage of his journey. This time he's navigating a lagoon, visiting the city's largest fish market and exploring the forests that could prove a vital tool in the fight against climate change. So I'm here on the canal. This morning, uh, starting my trip uh, to the lagoon. This is actually how uh, water looks like. Yes, you're right, it's black. I entered the lagoon just a few hundred meters away. What I expect now, at least a much clear and clean water. In the beginning, it doesn't look like any better, but uh, for everyone, it looks promising. They say the biggest fish market is here on the corner and I must visit right now. So the biggest market, the biggest fish market here in Igombo. They say most of the products here comes from the lagoon, but some fishermen also come from the ocean. And uh, let's have a look. Looks very busy. I was told that here in Sri Lanka, fish stocks have fallen dramatically in recent years and that pollution might be part of a problem. In this fish market, now the recently they don't have a lot of fish because they have the people, they are throwing a lot of the plastic and polythene bags, something like that. So going out of the market, uh, want to see the mangroves. I see a little waterway mangroves uh, to go somewhere inside, you know. Mangroves can be a very good weapon in fight against climate change. Somebody said to me that during the afternoon hours some uh, grilling processes are going on in the mangroves. But funny thing is, it's uh, not so easy to see something. Eh? But I can feel a nice smell of uh, something is grilling. <laughs> Maybe it's my lunch. What's going on? Food time. Food time. Wow, looks amazing. Prawns? Prawns. From the lagoon? Okay, so it's the same as I saw in a market today. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's not too much for me. Thank you, I appreciate it. Put some lime on the fish and prawns. 
but it's extremely good. This fish is amazing. And this is, uh, I know already from yesterday, is a coconut uh, with something. Mm, with a lemongrass. Amazing. I better go, I guess, as I uh, don't want to take it too long today. 40 past two and uh, is uh, in kilometers, around 10 kilometers probably still awaits on the uh, lagoon and uh, it's not so easy. I was expecting lagoon to be huge, but now when I'm here, it looks like middle of nowhere. I think I have a, a little crack here, I don't know. Uh, something unexpected have just happened and uh, yeah, I have uh, lots of water in my boat. I don't know uh, exactly why yet, but uh, here it is. Probably leaking somewhere. Uh. I discover it's the waves spilling over into a boat. By the time I get most of the water out, night is approaching fast. Still a few kilometers to go and the sun is down already. Now is absolutely the time to get out from here. I can see already lights there in front of me, maybe in a couple kilometers. And this is All Saints Church lights. I googled already before and now I have to reach this place. Otherwise it's uh, maybe too dangerous to stay with so-called crocodiles. I didn't see them, but don't want to feel them for sure. And it's getting completely dark now soon. Probably will not manage to reach the place with any kind of light. I have a torch. So now remains to just keep going. And do join us next week to see if Carolus makes it all the way to the end. Also coming up. Raljan's in Dublin on the 100th birthday of one of its best known but most challenging classic novels and meeting what have to be some of the luckiest librarians in the world. Whoa, look at this. The ceiling is incredible. And it goes on and on for a long, long way. This must be at least 60 metres or something. And you can see more of our recent travels on the BBC iPlayer. You can check us out on Facebook and Instagram too. Just search BBC Travel Show and look for that little blue logo. But until next time from all of us here in Chile and Patagonia, it's goodbye. Oh,